today is the day the Spirit has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Understanding and knowing there's one power, one presence, known by many names. It is an energy. It is a creative force of the universe. It is that which is in each and every one of us. It is around us. It lives in us, around us, through us, and expresses through us. This morning we come together in total and complete love, understanding that each and every one of us is the divine presence of spirit. I declare right here, right now, this service is complete. That each and every one of us coming here this morning with whatever concern or whatever joy is on our hearts is fully expressed. Whatever needs to be healed is already healed. What has to be taken care of is already taken care of. And those who may not be with us in the physical presence are here with us in our consciousness. And we hold them in love and light. I know today is a wonderful day. As each and every day is a wonderful day. And right here this morning, I bless each and every one of us. And that our hearts will be open to hear the message for our individual being. I anchor these words in love. And I know as I send them out, they will not be returned to me more, but will and already have been fulfilled. And I invite you to express and anchor these words with me this morning by simply saying, and so it is. Good morning, church. Good morning. Hey, hey, hey. I am Reverend Amadra. Welcome. It's so good to be back. I really didn't go anywhere. I just haven't been here. <laughs> We're going to have an opening song by our beautiful musician, Michael. Good morning. I don't know if this is wrong. Yeah. You can have a check. There's one check. Yeah. Can we turn it on? Oh. One, two, three. One, two, three. One, two, three. Two, three. One, two, three. Well, did you hear about the minister that was trying to cross the lake to get to the other side? Did you hear that one? No. You're not going to hear it from me either. So. How about the three ministers that were fishing? Check one. There we are. I'm <laughs> sorry. Okay. Oh, a little bit of a comedian there. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. So good to be here with you. So I said a prayer for you today. A simple prayer. I often pray. A prayer I always like to say For friends I need a longer way This prayer, my friend, is just for you That you be blessed in all you do In everything and you pursue, and may all your dreams come true. I said a prayer for you today. Your dreams come true. 
say something about Power Eight, Reverend Lori? Did you want to say something? No, we're meeting today at eleven twenty. Okay. And new people can come um, if they if they're not signed up. We won't be able to do a ten intent for them, but they can come and just hold space. For okay. Them. Just All right. Join the circle. They can just join the circle. Okay, good. So 1120, and we will be doing our second session of Power of Eight. So our volunteers this morning, I want to say thank you for volunteering. Volunteers is what has us have everything work together as one on Sunday so that we can come and sit down and just enjoy the service. So this morning, refreshments are by Morgan, and our flowers Beautiful flowers are by Juanita and Katina and Larry for our video. And Melissa, and Melissa was out to this morning as a greeter, right? Yeah, at the greeting table. So thank you to all our volunteers. And now, and if you are interested in helping out, please just let Reverend Kate or myself know. Yes, Larry. Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize, I know this has been announced before, but uh, I've been fortunate enough to be here every Sunday to do the videography for this service, but there might be a time when I'm not able to be here, and that's what we're looking for, someone or someone who can maybe be backups in case I can't be here on a Sunday or something. It's not too difficult to learn. I think it might be an hour and a half, two hours of study. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but just, just to follow me, the biggest thing is just catching the people as they're gone, and I like to try to fill the frame with people. So it's, you know, it's a little challenging how to operate, but you know, it's pretty simple. It's an iPad, I guess it is, if you work. So think about it, come to me afterwards if you'd like to serve. Okay, please help my brother out, okay? <laughs> He's asking for help. Thank you, Mary. Uh, just a reminder that we are actually going to be having a memorial gratitude well in India. And 100% of the money that we collect from our Power of A class is going to actually go towards purchasing that well. Thank you, Reverend Laurie. So isn't that neat? Like we're here in California and halfway across the world, we'll be supplying individuals with fresh water. I mean, unless you live in a place where there's no water, you don't appreciate it. You know, when I was in Africa for that year, some houses didn't have running water. They had to go to the well and carry it back to the house. That's when you really appreciate it. But some of you who grew up with those outhouses, and no running water, you know what I'm talking about. Okay? So thank you Can for I just say something real quick? Yeah. yeah, I do want to thank everybody here. We raised the money basically in one day. That was amazing for this oh one. So thank you very much. These people in Odisha, India, 30% of them are poor and they're below poverty level. They're multi-dimensionally poor. And right now they have monsoons there. And when they have monsoons, everything is destroyed. They have to start all over again every single year. So, and they do have to walk an hour to get dirty water with bugs in it. So this at least takes one thing off their plate. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. And so I want to remind everyone, uh, when you leave, please take your car. You know, you may want to go out to lunch and that's fine. Just park on the street because we do lots of parking lot when, um, after service. So I would invite everyone to join me in our group reading this morning. It's found inside of your program. And let's read together aloud. God is all, both visible and invisible. One presence, one mind, one power is all. This one that is all is perfect love and perfect abundance. I am the individualized expression of God. I am everyone who is perfect life. Perfect love and perfect life. And I would ask you stand for our group song this morning. Please stand, yes. And yes. it stayed on spirit, Michael? Mm -hmm. They actually have the words. Uh, does everyone have the words? Yeah. We're going to do verses 1, 3, and 4. One Verses 1, 3, and 4. 4 and 1 are both the same. So we'll just do them once, twice. 
So it's um studying New Thought in 1887 in Colorado. After she experienced a healing of a persistent throat infection, she also became a healer and was one of the founders of the Divine Science denomination. I've never heard of her. Have you? Yes. Have any of you heard of her? Okay. All the ministers have. <laughs> We have some work to do. <laughs> Metaphysical healing is a life. It's meant, it means studying to learn the truth and applying the truth to every event of the day. It means regulating every thought, every emotion, bringing them into unison with the controlling mind of the universe. Such living brings to the one who practices it an aliveness, aliveness that means utmost satisfaction and joy. I make a distinction between healing and curing. Health, in the beginning of its history, meant wholeness, and to heal meant to make whole. The word cure, in its original form, means to give attention to, to take care of. Healing deals with the cause of disease, while curing is a surface process somewhat like cutting off the head of a weed and leaving the root attached. Healing is not applied to the entire individual, not to the body alone. It changes circumstances for the better. It transforms character. It gives mental stability and power. It brings joy and success. All of these are included in healing 
And if the law of healing is understood and exercised, these will be the signs that follow. Mark 16, 17. Thank you. So we will have uh, music by Michael, and then after that, we will have Reverend Kate delivering our message for this morning. adjust the microphone. He's like, oh. <laughs> Good morning. Let's give Michael Paul another round of applause. <laughs> no, you don't know how lucky you are, but Michael Paul agreed to um, play for us at the last minute, so he's substituting, and we are so, so blessed to have you with us today. So, come back next week. That's his regular day. <laughs> He's scheduled for us, so we'll be doubly blessed. Um, well, it's really great to be here. After the pandemic, I just 
I just am so grateful. I really notice that, you know, absence makes the heart grow fonder, right? So I feel very, very happy to um, be here. And uh, when I was, you know, trying to think about, oh, what am I going to talk about? It was thank you. So thank you, everyone, for being here today. You know, I mean, through this time of isolation, it surprised me how much I'm happy that that's kind of over because actually I consider myself to be a very kind of a solitary and self-reliant person. You know, if you drop me off in the wilderness with a book of matches and a knife, I could probably last days and days. I'm that kind of person. I would be happy. Maybe a water bottle, too. But, you know, I know how to build a campfire all by myself. I, you know, so, I mean, just imagine yourself, right? If you were sitting having a little campfire by yourself, and it was okay, and that was kind of like, on the good days, what the pandemic was like, right? There were some other not good days, but, but on a good day. And then imagine, wow, you know, we're not alone anymore. It's like now we're having the whole big group, whole big campfire, and we've all come together. And, um, you know, we can sing together, we can see our friends and family even, and and uh, have some refreshments. It's a lot of fun and, and renewing. And that's when I felt about the class that, um, Reverend Laura gave last week, and that's continuing today, the power of eight. Because what we do is, is we sit in a circle. You know, we have that community feeling of sitting in a circle, that a real wonderful feeling of togetherness. And that feeling of togetherness, whether it's now in this room or we're not in a circle or later when we will be in a circle, it's, it's just that we have the shared intention to be together um, and it resonates so deeply and so powerfully within us. That power, that light within when we join together, it, it's really magnified. So I just want to say, you know, I now right now my role is the speaker, but this is really a community event. Whatever your role in it is, together we're making it happen, you know. Right this moment, I'm the storyteller. You can like it or, you know. But hopefully you like the atmosphere, no matter what you think about the story. You know, we all have our talents, more or less. We all have our way of seeing and expressing life. And, and I tend to see and express things in words. And we have other people I know in this room who are very creative with their hands. And, you know, we have a fabulous dancer who's very creative artistically that way. And, and we have artists in this room. Uh, there's just all kinds of ways of expressing life. It's not just a performance. We're all expressing what we believe all the time. Now, is that right? Do you agree with that? Yes. Do you feel like you are express, expressing what you believe all the time? Well, I have to say, because sometimes I wish I weren't, you know, I wish I were expressing something else. But this is sort of one of the, this can be, one of the great conundrums or puzzles of our new thought teaching because while we take very seriously the idea that it is done unto you as you believe that can get translated in your mind as oh well then does that mean i'm to blame for everything that has gone wrong or that i don't like in my in my life does that mean if I'm sick or poor or unhappy or if I have a car accident, was I responsible? So, you know, the answer isn't really clear cut. It's kind of a yes and kind of a no. You know, is a tree responsible for the fact that it got struck by lightning? Not really, except they got really, really tall. You know, 
Well, maybe the tallest tree. <laughs> what about a trout? Is a trout responsible for the fact that it gets caught by someone fishing? So I would say no, not really. I mean, we do know that really old trouts that do live a long time do learn to hide under rocks and things, right? So in that way, maybe. But the thing is, you know, it's like Reverend Maureen said last week. She said you could think of life as being like a candy shop. You're there. All things are possible. And what she said is, you have to make a decision. Life's like a candy shop. You walk in, what do you want? You've got to decide. She said that every successful person is a success because they use ideas that come out of their mind, which is the one mind, and because they weren't afraid to make decisions. And she said that every failure, and she was talking about the book, um, The Power of Decision, that we're talking about today, in which Raymond Charles Barker said that every failure comes from an indecisive mind, not necessarily from a bad mind, from an indecisive mind. Now, in a real candy shop, if you don't make up your mind, you're just going to stand there for a long time until, <laughs> until you finally do, right? But in this life, uh, it doesn't go that way. In this metaphorical candy shop, you don't just get to wait with nothing happening. Life keeps happening. It keeps coming at you. You know, it doesn't stop while you are busy picking this exact thing. It's just coming all the time. And the thing is, really, until you make a conscious decision, you're either going to get results based on unconscious thoughts or maybe on someone else's thoughts or just maybe random thoughts. This is what's happening today in the world. So in my mind, I, I think about it as, you know, you can either just float down the river and end up wherever life takes you or you can pick up your paddle, right? And you can go where you want, or at least make a good effort towards getting where you want. And so I think of teaching new thought principles is really not that different than teaching someone how to paddle their own canoe. And since we reopen, we have really made an effort to plunge back into using our teaching. So we've talked about miracles, we've talked about manifestation, and now we're talking about this idea, the idea of choice. We're at choice, that we need to make um, decisions. So we're, we're using um, as inspiration the book. Here's a new book, The Power of Decision. And we now have it in our bookstore, if you haven't read it. So how many people have read this book? Or maybe you recognize this one, oh, the old version. Yeah, okay, so a lot of you have, but then a lot of you have not also, and so I cannot recommend it too much. It is, it's funny because the chapter isn't that long, but there's no way I could fit even the one chapter on Decide to be Healthy into this talk. There's so much in it. Um, and it's really helpful because Raymond Charles Barker was very direct. If you have the book and you're trying to make a decision about reading it, does that count? <laughs> yes. Thank you, Larry. Get the book and decide to read it. Right. Right. Definitely. That's what we need to do. We need to follow through. So um, I highly recommend it. Uh, and the thing is, there's a lot of chapters in the book, and they're very targeted, you know, about prosperity, health, creativity. We'll talk about a few of them. We won't go on and on, so we'll, we'll do a few chapters, but I, I do recommend it. And even though, like, Decide to be Healthy isn't one of the first chapters in the book, I wanted to talk about it today because... Um, it is so fundamental to our teaching. 
So it might be easier to teach prosperity because a student can actually see, oh, do I have more money this week than I had two months ago? Or teach how to manifest a parking lot, because you either get it or you don't. <laughs> and when you're doing working with your health, it can be a little like, oh, well, did my headache go away, or was it going to anyway? You know, It can be a little more nebulous to judge the results. But you have to realize, and I think this is so important, and Nona Brooks, uh, Verla read the passage by Nona Brooks. So Nona Brooks worked with Melinda Kramer. Nona Brooks was in Colorado. Melinda Kramer was a minister in the San Francisco area, and they founded Divine Science. And then in Missouri, the Fillmores were founding Unity. And then about 20 years later or so, Ernest Holmes founded our denomination, Religious Science, or now called Centers for Spiritual Living. And so it was Melinda Kramer, I think, who actually ordained Ernest Holmes. So she, you know, they, Melinda Kramer and Nona Brooks, are actually quite important in the evolution of what we call religious science. Um, and like Verla said, it was physical healing that drove the early teaching of new thought. Because if you think about life in the early and mid-1800s in the United States, and you think about what doctors were doing, you know, well, a lot of them were barbers, right? But medical doctors, even in hospitals, were more concerned about um, using leeches and cleaning people and hadn't even realized that you could control infections by having the doctor wash their hands between patients. So when people discovered how great new thought was, they really did embrace it. So thank you, soap, right? <laughs> Y'all be grateful for soap. <laughs> so here's what um, Dr. Barker had to say about health. And this is from the beginning of the chapter. He said, and he was not really a humble person. He said, for more than 50 years, I have been practicing spiritual mind healing. Because of my many years of practice, I am considered one of the leading authorities in this field. I know it from A to Z. The general public has always been skeptical regarding mental healing because it has never taken in the pains to study the science, which is its foundation, people have found it easier to scoff at it than to investigate it. They believe it is easier to use medicine or surgery than to change basic subconscious patterns of belief. And for them, this is true, right? What you believe, you experience. If that's what you believe, it's true. And then he goes on. Spiritual mind healing will never be in real competition with accredited medical practice because its appeal is limited to those persons who view life as a spiritual experience. That would be the people in this room and our friends and many groups all over the world who also believe that. He says... In today's successful world, they are few and far between. I believe it is more common today than when he wrote this book. But he says, faith in general has been transferred by most people from God to the checkbook. The checkbook they are certain of. As to God, they're a little more indefinite. They may or may not believe. The checkbook guarantees them excellent medical assistance, and so it usually wins out. Despite this, there are many thousands who believe in and practice mental healing with excellent results. They are usually quiet, well-mannered, do not shout their beliefs and their healings from the rooftops or on street corners, 
They are certain of what they know and they rely on their methods. While others combine their faith with medical assistance whenever the gravity of the situation makes it seem like it would be useful. And then he says, there is no conflict between the systems of spiritual mind healing and medical practice. There is no conflict. They're simply good and more good. He said a hundred years ago it was a different matter. Medicine was not as progressive as it is today. And so metaphysicians rejected it and denounced it because they had a total faith in mental healing and any who did not agree with them were their enemies. Now I wanted to bring this up and read this to you because sometimes in our organization and other organizations where they teach spiritual healing, there is a leftover prejudice against modern medicine. And so, you know, times have changed. Things are available to us that are fine, they're wonderful. Why not use them? It's fine. And that's what he says. This has changed with the tremendous strides in the medical field. No longer can its methods be denounced. Modern medicine has earned the right to be respected. Its research programs every year are revealing more and more methods of dealing with physical and emotional illness. This is close to my heart because my own father was a Christian scientist who died at a very young age, only having a Christian, pra Christian science practitioner. Um, and on the other hand, at that time, there was no cure for what he had, which was um, Hodgkin's. But today, there is. You know, things have progressed. So maybe back then it wouldn't have mattered, but, but today there's more and more available and so we can open our minds and recognize that there are different paths to healing. There is the path of modern medicine, if you want to call it. I don't know what you would call it. Ordinary <coughs> medicine. And there is the path of mental healing. And then there is a combination of the two, which I think most of us um, follow when it's possible, but there is something amazing about spiritual healing. It worked 200 years ago, and it works today. There's no change in how well it works. Um, so, Oh yeah, that's what I was going to mention. We had one of the ministers who trained here was actually a, a practicing pediatrician. And one of the practitioners that um, we trained was a, has her doctorate in physical therapy. I'm just saying, you know, as Ernest Holmes always said, we are heading towards the day when religion and science can walk hand in hand in so many ways. So we can choose to use what's helpful when we need help. But the thing that really does matter for all of us, the thing that we really need to be crystal clear on, is to just recognize how often it is that we're paying attention to illness. And you just turn on the TV and watch the news, and you're going to see ads for commercial ads and commercials for medicine and this and that non-stop you know and, and our society does tend to think a lot about illness we pay attention to it um and barker says this has to change we need to decide to be healthy and then praise your good health now you don't have to wait until you're super healthy to praise your good health. There's always something to praise. Just the fact that I can breathe is worth praise. Just the fact that I woke up in the morning is worth praise. You know, this morning I woke up with a headache, for instance. I just sat there, laid there for a moment, 
saying in my mind a few times, there is good for me and I ought to have it. There is good for me and I ought to have it. There is good for me and I ought to have it. This is another day to be glad in. And I don't have a headache anymore. I mean, it really does work in so many ways. Um, so he says, we should praise our good health because we know that it's what we are thinking about that we are calling into our experience. He says, the more you impress upon your subconscious mind the normalcy and the value of health, the more secure you are in your health. And of course, he says, you know, this doesn't mean that you can just not eat a balanced diet or not what do whatever you ought to be doing. It assumes that, you know, if you were a houseplant, you wouldn't just pray over it and never give it a drop of water, right? You, you take care <laughs> of things. Yeah. Now, he suggested that what we ought to do, and I hope you have your green piece of paper. You want to get one of these? And open it up. He says, say something like this. So we're going to read this top section together, because I want you to get started on it right now. So we'll just read the first part underneath the words, I praise my health. So please read it with me. There is one source, one cause, one life, and one mind. And this is God. My health and well-being are this one life functioning freely in me as me. I praise this health. I rejoice in this health. I am this health, which is spiritual, perfect, and free. No guilt or fear in my subconscious mind can interrupt or affect his health. I declare its permanency, even as I know the spirit within me is permanent. I wanted you to have that, whether you have the book or not, because this is, you know, what we're trying to do is incorporate spiritual practices into our everyday life. And this is a very easy one, just to remind ourselves to make a decision to be healthy and to follow through. If you want to be well, we need to decide to be well. By doing these practices, we're creating what you might think of as a mental atmosphere of wellness. So we can't be half-hearted about it and expect success. We've got to be mindful and keep a constant, not like a worried focus, but just a gentle focus on wellness, on remembering what it is that we want to see and experience instead of looking at what you don't want to see. So, um, if you were looking at a child and they were doing all kinds of things because they're so busy, what is it that you're going to praise and focus on? The things that you like, you know? When they say please and thank you, you're going to praise that, right? And the rest you can just ignore. So it's kind of like that. What you praise, you will experience more of. Now some people, I know not necessarily anyone in this room, may need to drastically change their thinking. But most of us just need to be more mindful, more self-aware. Whatever your situation is, um, we've got to think clearly. Parker wrote that it takes clear thinking on the part of a conscious mind and that you can't do clear thinking until you have made your decision. The decision, making a decision, lifts and clears the mental fog. 
mental healing is not so much hard work as it is serious work because our bodies are always responding to our thoughts about our bodies. And this is true because our subconscious mind can only create out of our own beliefs, not out of somebody else's beliefs. So if you do go to the doctor and they say you're fine, it's important <laughs> that you listen and incorporate it and you think it. If you do go to the doctor and they say, oh, you're not fine, it's still important that you say, yes, I am, I'm fine. I'm going to listen and incorporate what I know to be true, which is there is something in me which is always perfect, whole, and complete, and I am fine, actually. That's my truth. So making a decision is important. Doing our own spiritual practice is important. But I just want to also make sure you know, you don't have to go it alone. Well, Barker says we need to believe. We need to make a decision. We need to believe that this is the decision that we want to follow through with. But then we're not on our own. Then other people can help us. You know, this is what I, I think today I'll call it the campfire effect. You know, we get support. That's what we're doing here today. If you want to leave a treatment request, what happens, this is what I was taught. The fact that someone asks indicates their willingness to accept. So that's why we say, write it down. Put it in the box in the lobby and we'll treat for you for a week. You don't really need to know treatment. We'll do the treatment for you, but the act of writing it down on the piece of paper, that's the decision-making process. That's the important part that each of us has to begin with. So we will talk more about prayer treatment, and if you are coming to the um, Power of Eight group, that is basically taking the heart of treatment, which is setting the intention and visualizing it and believing it to be true. And this is a process that we can all do, but it doesn't start, it can't start until that decision has been made. Because what we do in mental healing is recognize the essential truth of health that is already ours on the spiritual plane. And so by seeing it, praising it, accepting it, we allow it to come into expression. We accept that in your lives. And this is what we're talking about when we say life is kind of like a mirror, kind of like an echo of our thoughts. Parker said that spiritual recognition of your health is the great step in any healing. It is required in spiritual healing. That you cannot, all of us, we cannot emphasize enough in our minds that God is life. God is health, perfect action, strength, and vitality. So, that brings us to the second reading on the bottom half. He said, recognize this. Read this over to yourself. So we're going to read it together underneath the words, there is one life. There is one life, God, and that life is my life now. The mind that created by my body is the mind that maintains my body. It knows exactly what to do to keep me in good health. I affirm the perfect action of life. I praise my health, for it is of God. Intelligence alerts me to every means of maintaining and expanding my health. My subconscious mind accepts these statements and acts upon them. This is a spiritual practice, saying this, just an illustration. 
of how it is that by praising our health, by using our imagination, and then by visualizing ourselves as how we want to be. Dancing, walking, in any state that we would like to envision ourselves. Don't, you know, don't visualize yourself having trouble with whatever it is you might feel like you're having trouble. Visualize yourself as you wish to be without any disabilities when you're thinking about your health. He says you can't think about how healthy you are for 10 minutes a day and then spend the rest of the day worrying about yourself, right? We've got to keep it. We've got to keep going back to it. Make the decision and stick with it. So back to the candy store. Barker says, we need to select our thoughts as carefully as we select our food in the grocery store, right? Or our candy in the candy store. Let's be conscious. That is the whole secret to beginning and accepting more health in our lives. So let's remember what it is we know about God. Where is God? Where do we experience God? Within it's everywhere, it's everything. We experience the connection with God within ourselves. God is the all. God is the all good. And since each of us must be and is a center in this infinite universe, each of us is an expression of this allness, then health, life, prosperity, and good, love, these are our essential truths. So that's the end of my story this week. Uh, thank you for letting me share it. I think it's time um, for Michael Paul to give us anon another wonderful song, and I just want to invite everyone to consider reading the book, The Power of Decision, and to begin using these affirmative passages in your daily life. And just know that there is good for us, and we ought to have it. And so it is. Thank you. 
Okay, so right now we're uh, being transformed into what I think of as the red party time. So our moment of conscious giving. Um, and it's, I was thinking, oh, I said prosperity is so easy when you barely needed to talk about it, right? The easily manifestation. And let's know that's true. Let's know that this center is growing and prosperous in so many ways, and in, in people, and in everything we need and that what's true for the center is true for each of us because we are it so I give thanks for the prosperity which is ours to share and I know that all is well and so it is Dr. Maddy uh, to close us out with a spiritual mind treatment. After which we will sing the song on the back of your program and then adjourn to fellowship. Good morning. Good morning. We leave today knowing that there is one life. That life is God's life. <clears throat> And that life is my life now. That life is a life of health and giving and knowing the truth of our being, that we live in a consciousness of all good, and that good is each of ours to choose. And so this morning, 
I leave knowing that we all choose health, the health of God. My health is the health of God. Your health is the health of God. And therefore, we know we live in the consciousness of the all good. And I claim that good for each of us this week as we go about our daily business, holding the truth of love, light, and joy in our hearts, for spirit is all there is. This is the truth. I know it. I know it for each of us. I claim it now. And so, with a heart full of joy, a heart full of love, I simply say thank you, release it, and let it go. And together, please join me in saying, and so it is. Thank you.